sound speeds. And boy, am I excited to be sharing with you a lot of information this episode. And I do mean a lot of information for this hour long episode. An hour. Yes, I know it's an hour. Try to stay with it. Even if you have to watch it in multiple different sittings, it is such an important video to watch because there is so much information from an expert that you just, you really do have to see it and hear it to believe it all. There's too much information that you're probably not going to get elsewhere online. No, it's not clickbait. And yes, we are going to be answering the question of, can you really trust an advertised frequency response? And basically the mic specs in general, can you trust them? Where did this whole idea come from? Let me show you. I don't trust this company's microphones. And I know all of you are asking, but Bandrew, why don't you trust them? Well, let me go ahead and tell you. So right here, this is the frequency response graph of the MPM 2000. Now here is the frequency response graph of the MPM 1000. Now here they are overlaid. They are nearly identical, but the 2000 just has a thinner line on the graph and it's focused at around negative 32 decibels instead of negative 38 decibels. So there are two possible reasons for this. The first one being that these are the exact same microphone with the exact same tone. The MPM 1000 is just slightly quieter and to my ear that is just not the case. Or secondly, these frequency response graphs are just made up. And just for comparison's sake, so you can hear the similarities or differences between the microphones, now I'm speaking into the MPM 1000, and I will level match them so there's no discrepancy in volume, and you'll have a fair comparison. I've seen a lot of frequency response charts in my life, but never have I seen two that look almost completely identical, yet the microphones sound so drastically different. So I think this warrants an investigation. Thinking about it, I need to find an audio engineer with a lot of credentials who is an expert on testing microphones. Oh, did I find the guy. Let me tell you about Ray A. Rayburn. He is the principal consultant with Sound First LLC. Previously, he was principal consultant with K2 Audio of Boulder, Colorado. He is a fellow of the Audio Engineering Society and a member of the Acoustical Society of America. He is chairman of the AES Standards Subcommittee on Interconnections and the Working Group on Audio Connectors. He is a member and former chairman of the AES Technical Committee on Signal Processing. He was a member of the American National Standards Institute, ANSI, Accredited Standards Committee, ASC, S4 on Audio Engineering. He is a member of the AES Standards Working Group on Microphone Measurement and Characteristics. He was one of the developers of the ANSI Infocom Standard on Audio Coverage Uniformity. He currently leads Infocom Standards Working Group on Spectral Balance, and as if that's not enough, he's an educator that teaches churches worldwide on how to improve their audio quality. This is a man we can trust to help us find our answers. Without further delay, let me introduce you to Ray A. Rayburn. Ray, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. When it comes to testing and comparing microphones, what is it the AES is trying to accomplish? Well, the Audio Engineering Society has a working group uh, on what they call microphone characterization. So this is not how microphones are designed, but once you have a product, how do you create a data sheet for it with all of the specifications and the frequency response of the microphone and the polar response and uh, all of that sort of thing. And uh, so they've been working on this for, for many years because Many, you know, all the different manufacturers all have slightly different ways that they have been doing their testing. And ideally, obviously, as a microphone user, we would like to be able to compare the results from any manufacturer and know that, you know, you can you can compare uh, microphone A from manufacturer uh, X and microphone B from uh, manufacturer Y. Um, Unfortunately, <laughs> that hasn't really been the case. And uh, so the, the AES is, is working to try to get the manufacturers uh, together on that. Can you give us an example of something AES has done to try to make this happen? Uh, they decided, well, why don't we get some manufacturers to agree to each contribute a microphone to a pool and then we'll send this set of microphones around to the different manufacturers uh, that are contributing to this thing and let each manufacturer test the complete set of microphones. 
so then we can compare the test results. Sounds like a fair thing to ask. Yeah, and they they did that, and there were 10 manufacturers, I believe, that uh, de decided to cooperate. And what was the result? <laughs> well, that's the problem. Uh, apparently, there were enough manufacturers that were embarrassed at how different their results were from other manufacturers that the companies decided they would not release the test results to anybody but the other 10 uh, uh, companies in the group of 10. They wouldn't even release them to the, the rest of the working group in the Audio Engineering Society. Did any manufacturer cooperate? Now, I think one or two of the manufacturers released their results uh, to the entire group, but the rest of them said no. And that just tells me that there's there's still a long way to go. Everyone must have been embarrassed when they compared the results with the group. One of the embarrassing things I know from at least one of the manufacturers involved was that the one or two companies that did release the results to the entire group, um, this one manufacturer, they, they both had results that looked fairly similar. And one manufacturer's microphone that they had contributed to this um, did not test out as being very close to the specification, the published specifications, let's say. What's a question AES is asking and trying to get the answer to? Can we get specifications that can be compared between the various manufacturers? And let's just say they've had some, some progress uh, you know, in particular, one of the things that I think they've gotten fairly well, in, uh, you know, everybody a lot closer to agreeing on is how to measure the noise floor of a microphone. Mm. Okay. And so, uh, that, that has been one thing, which I think is a, a distinct, uh, improvement. Uh, but, uh, it's, it, there's, there's still a long way to go, let's say, uh, getting, uh, uh, everything. What specs should we be looking at when trying to figure out how a microphone sounds? Specifications don't necessarily tell you everything. You know, for example, the old U87 microphones had a transformer based electronics in them. The current production U87 microphones have a transformer-less uh, uh, circuitry, and the fact that there is not a transformer in there uh, makes a difference in the sound. And so the old U87s, uh, they sound maybe not dramatically different, but they do sound different than the modern production ones with uh, a transformer-less uh, circuit. And, and so, the, yeah, there's a lot of little, little, uh, little subtleties uh, to things. And as I say, that particular one, I wouldn't know what to tell you to look for on a data sheet that would show that, you know, that there's that difference in sound. But if you listen to them, you'll tell. What are some examples of specs that we should be able to look at and easily make sense of? Things that are easier to... Uh, to tell would be things like the noise floor. Uh, you know, it, so if you're trying to record something very soft, so you want a microphone with a very low uh, uh, inherent noise, uh, then uh, that that is a good specification to look at. Uh, on the other hand, if you are trying to record very loud sounds, the um, maximum SPL that the microphone can take is is a very important thing to look at and the specification sheet will definitely give you good guidance there. So Ray, when you're testing a microphone, what do you need to do it properly? Uh, first thing, I need a, uh, a space to do the testing in. And uh, this could be an anechoic chamber. In other words, something that absorbs all the sounds that hit the walls of the thing and don't bounce back in and contaminate the measurements. Or I could be using a 
test method or software package that allows me to ignore the reflections from the surfaces of the test chamber. This is a, a technique uh, in various iterations of how it's exactly done software wise, but that uh, many manufacturers uh, uh, use some variation on this on this basic idea uh, so they don't have to physically have a, an anechoic chamber they just need a big room so then they the next thing you need is a reference microphone you take it and you send it to the uh, to NIST the National Institutes of Science and Technology and they will calibrate your your microphone for you and uh, so to get that calibrated out to 20 kilohertz, plus or minus three tenths of a dB, costs you roughly 10 grand. Oh. Huh. Yeah. So not having 10 grand to, to throw at, at that, uh, I uh, uh, got a chance to get a hold of an entire production run of capsules out of uh, uh, ACO that they had measured in a, with a methodology very similar to what NIST uses. And I was looking for two, two capsules that would be as close as possible to exactly the same frequency response and as close as possible to dead flat. And so I, I found those two capsules out of the batch of 100 and bought them from them. Wow. So a big room for testing and a flat, accurate reference microphone. Is there anything else you need? The next thing is you need a uh, coaxial loudspeaker. And the reason you need to be a coaxial is if you have a loudspeaker with a, with a woofer and a, and a, and a tweeter, they're at different points in space. And so whatever distance away you are measuring from, obviously really tiny differences in the position of the microphone are gonna make a difference in the time of arrival of the woofer and the tweeter signals and mess up your, your measurements. Gotcha. So you really want to have a, uh, have a coaxial loudspeaker and then uh, measure, uh, that way your exact positioning of the microphone you're testing becomes much less critical. Are coaxial speakers usually flat? The loudspeaker is not going to be flat. That's just a given. And so uh, what you do is you measure the uh, location uh, at a given point in space. You put your, your, your uh, reference microphone there you measure the response of the loudspeaker. And then you take the reference microphone out of that point, uh, put the uh, microphone you're going to test in exact same point in space and take another measurement. And now that measurement has both the loudspeaker's response and the microphone's response superimposed. But since we know what the response of the loudspeaker by itself is, because we have captured that with a with the reference microphone, mm -hmm. we can now subtract the one from the other. Gotcha. And get just the response of the uh, microphone we're testing. The advertised frequency response is the production goal when manufacturing a microphone. But how much deviation from that is acceptable? Like plus or minus how many dB? The tolerances are not. The plus and the minus tolerance are not the same. And, and so you might have a plus one and a half and a minus five. If it widens out to plus or minus three dB, that's a difference of six dB from one microphone to another, even if they're the same make and model, right? Well, I, I think that a lot of manufacturers will take a uh, measurement uh, of the microphone and then uh, take, um, you know, the, so your basic artist tools, you know, your curves and, and, and uh, drafting curves and, and things like this, and 
sort of manually make an approximation of that curve that is nice and smooth instead of jaggedy. And the, there, there is a certain amount of jaggediness that, you, that you're going to get in uh, uh, measurements uh, just uh, by the nature of, you know, things are less than perfectly precise. How much frequency response smoothing is acceptable? How accurate are you trying to get? Uh, for example, um, I found that if, if I'm going to get the best accuracy and need the least amount of smoothing, uh, I need to have sound going through that loudspeaker at all times. So in between my test, I need to be running some big noise through that loudspeaker at the same level as my test signal would be uh, just to keep the, the loudspeaker, should we say, limbered up. Mm. Uh, and, and if I don't do that, if I, if I take a, uh, a response and then just not put no, no signal through the loudspeaker and then a minute or two later take another response, they might not be the the same and then if i if i start taking them as fast as i can a response and then as soon as that's done take another one so as that done take another one and so on then i see a drift in the in the overall shape of the of the response curves that i'm Ooh, getting that's as, interesting. The, as the as the loudspeaker warms up should we say yeah and uh, so uh, you know, there's there's little little subtleties like that. Plus, as a you know, they, they, there's no perfectly, uh, you know, even with doing everything we have, there's going to be some little jaggedies in there that are probably not in the actual response of the microphone, but are just aberrations of our of our test setup being less than perfect than a loudspeaker being less than perfectly repeatable from sweep to sweep, even doing everything we can to, uh, to get things uh, as good as we can. But if you want the most accurate test results, what is a best practice routine you will follow? What I will often do is um, apply uh, a one-third octave smoothing to things. And that... Um, that makes it a lot less critical. And if I if I was trying to do do response curves without smoothing, and and many of the ones on my website were done uh, without any without any smoothing, uh, and if you look at the strictly the high end uh, response, there's fine little jaggedinesses to the to the curve, and those jaggedies are. You know, you, you could argue whether they're really there or not, mm -hmm. or if it's just aberrations of how the testing was done. I read that you commonly create a plot that's plus or minus 15 dB, which is a range of 30 dB. Most companies post a response between about negative 3 dB and as high as maybe plus 6 or plus 8. So isn't plus or minus 15 kind of overkill? Well, okay, let, let, let's, let's put it this way. They are scaled such that the on-axis response at the very peak of the response, which is at around 12 kilohertz, is just about touching the top of that plus 15 uh, range. Now, when you get down to the one to two kilohertz, it, it's at plus 10. And uh, then uh, if you go uh, above oh, about 16 kilohertz, it, it's starting to drop off below plus 10, and uh, by the time you get to 20 kilohertz, it's just a little below zero. Gotcha. Okay, so that's that's the on-axis response, the most sensitive direction. If you then take the 90-degree curve, that is, through much of the range, it's hovering right around the 5 dB mark on that scale. But then once you get above about nine kilohertz, it starts dropping off and it hits minus 15 at around 16 kilohertz. Hmm. 
and and just falls off the bottom of the of the chart. And uh, then the the 180 degree curve, the low frequencies are right around at zero. The mid range is around minus five. Then it then it shoots up from there and peaks at around the uh, you know 12 kilohertz, and then dives sharply thereafter. And again, it falls off the bottom of the chart at around 18 kilohertz. And so even with uh, a chart that is 30 dB top to bottom, if you wanted to plot those three curves, the on axis, 90 degree and 180 degree, uh, at the extreme highs, uh, the everything but the on axis is falling off the bottom of the chart, uh, even, even with a 30 dB spread from top to bottom. Let me ask you this then, Ray. Our friend Bandrew over at Podcast has recently did a product review of a Marantz Pro microphone. And at the end of it, he brought out another Marantz Pro microphone of a different model that had an almost identical frequency response, yet the microphone sounded completely different. What are some reasons that could be? Well, okay. If they're different models, I assume? Correct. Okay. Then um, they you could have very similar on-axis response, but the off-axis response, you know, like the 90 and 180, but everything else in between is probably quite different uh, with, with, those, uh, with those two microphones. And so since we're not using them generally in an anechoic chamber, we're using them in a real room, there's you know, this, the sound comes in on axis, but also it bounces off the room surfaces and comes in uh, at all these different responses at the different angles off axis. Hmm. And so that winds up being a, uh, a reason why you cannot, uh, uh, why you can get two, two microphones that if you're only looking at the on axis response. Which is what uh, most microphone manufacturers post. Right. Uh, if you're only looking at that on-axis response, they 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 look similar, but they actually sound different because of all of the off-axis responses, which are not uh, the the same. And this is the also the reason why um, the sort of the fallacy behind microphone modeling, which is you know these DSP processors that say, oh, take your SM58. And we'll make it sound like a U87 for you, right? right. You know, and uh, they could, assuming that they're doing that, they have good measurements of the of the two microphones in question, and assuming that the SM58 you are using has the same response as the SM58 that they tested for doing their building air mic modeling. Um, that's still only comparing the on-axis responses. And that's so you can make the on-axis of that SM58 as processed by this box, similar to the on-axis response of that U87, but the off-axis responses will be totally different. So that's why the net results are Disappointing, let's say. That's only matching the frequency response, though. The other microphone specs play a big role in the way that microphone sounds. I mean, dynamic versus condenser, the background noise. I mean, am I right? Well, okay, yeah, and, and you you have uh, you know the uh, you know it's it's the impulse response of the microphone, the you know how how it handles transients. Uh, there's there's the the, the noise the no the noise the noise floor uh, uh, issues. And you know uh, the the diaphragm diameter of the SM58 is considerably smaller than that larger diameter uh, uh, U87 capsule, mm -hmm. which has a, about a one inch uh, diaphragm in terms of the working area of the diaphragm, though it's actually physically bigger than that. And so. That means that, as you say, when you have this grazing sound that goes across the front, you know, the U87, like any large diaphragm, is going to uh, uh, have a high high end roll off 
two grazing sounds, whereas the the SM58 is is not going to have that effect uh, to the same degree anyway, because it's a much smaller uh, diameter microphone. Now you, you go you go even further. You know you get a a, a little uh, a microphone like this, and uh, again the the diaphragm is so small that the difference in response for an omni between on axis into the microphone and, and at 90 degrees is not going to be that great uh, uh, because the, sti the diameter of that capsule is so small. Even within the same microphone manufacturers, you have inexpensive microphones and you have more expensive microphones. The quality standards with regards to production deviates according to microphone price. Therefore, would it be safe to assume that on a cheaper microphone, the specs could vary more? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, when you consider that the, uh, the diaphragms in these, in these microphones, uh, the tensioning of, those, of, the, of, the, of that plastic diaphragm, is is so is so critical and uh you know typical large large diaphragm uh microphone they start off with a with a plastic sheet and then they have a, a manufacturing jig that tries to pro provide exactly the same radial force at all angles around the the circle and then they put the back plate and they put the top part on and then they run in run in a whole bunch of screws around the edge to clamp it all while Keeping the tension on it in the manufacturing jig, then they cut cut the you know the excess off the outside, and that becomes your thing. But you know, there's, there's a lot of things that that can vary there. It can go wrong, you know. And you're talking about a very sensitive diaphragm. I mean, very sensitive. Oh yeah, and, and you know you're you're talking about uh, you know some very very thin plastic, and how evenly. Perfectly uniformly thick is that uh, across the surface? How how is the is the chemistry absolutely exactly the same? I mean, this is this is a polymer, and uh, uh, plastics are very complex uh, subject. I uh, while while I was in college, I worked for a company uh, that uh, made plastic uh, analysis equipment. And it, it, it was just amazing uh, how uh, you know subtle differences in the production of the of the plastic uh, could could make differences in the in the results, and then also temperature wise. Um, mm. Now, uh, you know, high end your your better large diaphragm microphones. If you if you look at the capsule, there's usually these screws around all around the edge of the diaphragm. Clamping it. That's a mechanically clamped. Um, some uh, precision uh, measurement capsules, uh, they, they actually laser weld the diaphragm in place all around the diameter. But most of your uh, recording microphones, other than the, the, than the large diaphragm type, uh, and your PA microphones and so on, the assembly of that microphone, the, the, the diaphragm into the, the rest of the structure and the magnet structure on a, on, a, on a dynamic, all of that is held in place with glue. Well, that would mean that everything and anything could change the way the microphone sounds even after production, everything from temperature to humidity. Well, that, that, I'll get to humidity, but uh, the, um, so most of our microphones are adhesively assembled. Okay. And so when the, the adhesive will stay pretty consistent until you get a little bit too hot. Mm -hmm. And then the combination of the force of the diaphragm that was being stretched and then glued in place. And the, so there's tension on that diaphragm and the combination of that diaphragm tension and the, the glue's just starting to loosen up can change the tensioning of, of this across the diaphragm so it isn't uniform in all directions. And mm. so you get a, a case that if the microphone once gets over some 
temperature, which is going to vary from microphone to microphone, depending upon which, what glue was used and other materials were used. But there'll be some temperature that if you get over that once, all bets are off on to, in terms of what the response of the microphone is. Is it possible that if I purchase a microphone online in the summer, that microphone could change in sound before it's delivered to me if it's left in a hot delivery vehicle for too long? Is yes. That so yeah. it could be. And, and I know certainly with, with if you're talking, talking about, you know, precision uh, measurement sort of grade microphones, if you leave the thing in your car in the summer just for a few hours. You've ruined it. You, you don't know what happened. It, you, you might get lucky and it might have not have changed much or or it might have changed significantly. Mm. Um, uh, I, I think I'd mentioned to you that there was a, uh, uh, an, a really inexpensive Chinese made measurement microphone that would sell for 90 bucks that I was just amazed at how good and consistent they were. Um, and until they suddenly weren't, <laughs> but uh, something changed in the production. But uh, anyway, didn't tell you. Uh, uh, yeah, of course, I didn't tell anybody. Uh, and uh, so one of my sons um, uh, owns a, a company that uh, does uh, audio, video, and lighting uh, uh, installs. And so I had gotten him one of these microphones that I had tested, and it was, this is beautiful. And he was using it for tuning his tuning sound systems. And then he came back to me, he says, Dad, I'm wondering if there's something wrong with this microphone, because the last couple of uh, systems I tuned it didn't sound right. Hmm. And I tested it, and sure enough, the microphone had changed. And ah. the best we can figure is that it, it sat in the sun a little bit too much. At some point, and gotcha. uh, and so he he's now using nothing but the microphones with the titanium diaphragms, which have hugely greater uh, ability to withstand heat. One time, and I really wish I had these these test results still, but um, I got hired to test every microphone in the uh, microphone closet of uh, CBS TV uh, oh, New wow. York City. Wow, that would have been I, awesome. I, and and this wasn't even every microphone they owned. These, these were just the ones that weren't on a set right now. Right. Okay, so there was something like 150 microphones. Mm. And one of the most fascinating things was, uh, you know, looking at two nominally identical microphones same brand same model and how consistent were they right now these of course these are all used microphones that who knows could be uh, you know They'd in their inventory for 10 years or yeah. something yeah and and some of them were uh you know really really close uh to each other still in their in their responses and uh some of them were embarrassingly bad. In fact, I flagged a few serial numbers for them and I said, you might want to retire these, <laughs> you know, and uh, um, the, one, of the, one of the interesting things I can still remember from, from doing that test was many years ago um, was that um, the, uh, the microphone that was the absolute most consistent were Sennheiser MKE-2s. They're little lapel mics. Yeah. Those were, uh, I mean, no matter how old the, old the mic was, those were just amazingly consistent sample wow. to sample. And uh, so, you know, it's like whatever Sennheiser was doing in the, in the design of that microphone, they, 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 they did it right. And, uh, you know, uh, as again, this is this is all used microphones from the from their you know CBS TV's inventory, and uh, but uh, there were there were some some other microphones that you know varied all over the place to sample the sample.
Let's go back to microphone measuring for a second. If you were testing a long shotgun microphone, would you back off farther from your test speaker than you would, say, a cardioid microphone that's designed for you to speak only a couple of inches off of? That is probably one of the, the issues of, you know, how do you, how do you test it? Because with, with an Omni microphone, it, it, the, the, the test distance doesn't really matter a whole lot. Right. You know, but uh, the more directional a microphone gets, the more uh, that that uh, uh, that the test distance uh, uh, makes makes a difference in the response. And then if you and it gets really crazy if you if you're trying to make meaningful measurements of a microphone that's designed for close talking, mm. because. Uh, you know, is the, is the microphone a quarter inch from the face of the loudspeaker or half an inch? That will make a difference at the low end. When testing a microphone, how far away is your coaxial test speaker from the microphone that you're measuring? Uh, I, I probably do uh, most of my measurements at roughly a meter from oh, really? the... Oh, uh, really? But I guess you're kind of in a, the, in a... The, you're in acoustically treated space, so... You're getting a very well. Again, I'm 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 doing a virtual anechoic right uh, measurement by uh, time windowing out the all, all the room reflections. If you test microphones one meter away and we typically speak about four inches off the mic, how is that going to sound different? The you're you're going to get a real low end uh, boost uh, uh, on the uh, uh, on that that closer. Uh, uh, Positioning, uh, my, yeah. uh, positioning. Uh, uh, probably, if you if you want to get a really dramatic example of that, uh, get a get a uh, uh, a large diaphragm ribbon mic. Right. Uh, you yeah. know, like a like a uh, a seventy seven DX or something like that. You know, and you start it out at at uh, you know eighteen inches away, and you just start bringing it in and bringing it in and oh, bringing yeah. it in and bringing it in. And man, does the does the low the low end just shoots you up. know heads for the sky as, as you as you as you get it as you work it real close. If you and manufacturers test microphones at a much greater distance than we actually use them, then how can we trust and rely on your test results? Well, okay, uh, part of that um, uh, you you will you will see that at least some manufacturers will have the main curve, which is the so we say the distant pickup, the one meter or whatever uh, uh, away uh, response. But then they will have dotted in over it, uh, uh, you know, maybe two curves with considerable low end boosts to them that uh, were taken at closer distances. But most manufacturers only post one. It doesn't sound to me like this is the most effective testing method. Does that make yes, sense? That is true. So how you know, can manufacturers? Uh, but you're, you're going, you're going, you're going to know that it. You're going to know you're going to get a low end, low frequency boost. Right. Uh, but that's not something we're told though. So we trust those responses to be accurate at a distance that makes sense for that particular microphone. There's a lot that we can't tell from the specs. There's a lot of stuff we can't learn from the specs. The more subtle details, you know, uh, it, it's. We do the tests we do on just about anything, but microphones in particular, in this case, because they're what are easy to do and have been shown to, you know, correlate, you know, just to, to a reasonable degree with what we're hearing. But that is not saying that they are the most important things, you know, uh, in, in life. I, I mean, I, one way to comparison I like to use is Analog recording and analog technology has been around for ages and ages. Right. And, you know, we, 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 we learned, you know, well, if we made a measure the frequency response, that means something. And uh, if we measure the total harmonic distortion, that, that means something. You know, if, if it has a high distortion, we can, we can hear that and, uh, and, and so on. And then when you got into uh, tape recorders, or uh, even uh, 
you know, uh, records, LPs. Um, you you got into speed variations, you know, or if that if that record wasn't perfectly centered, and uh, so it, it it wobbled a little bit as it, as it as it played, while well, you would get a, a pitch variation as the, as the record went around and it wasn't perfectly concentric. Oh, yes. You know, same thing with a tape recorder. If the mechanical pieces in the tape path weren't perfect, you know, you get subtle speed variations. Right. And so we, we, we came up with a measure for this called wow and flutter. You know, wow being the lower rate changes in pitch and flutter being very high, high rate uh, changes in pitch. And now... We, we, we went to digital recording suddenly. And oh, it's, this is wonderful. The frequency response is flat uh, and, and can go down to DC if we wanted at the low end. Uh, and the wow and flutter, what's that? It doesn't exist. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, the uh, 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 THD uh, really, really low. And we listened to this and a lot of people went, pew, it sounds lousy. And we're going, wait a minute, it, but it's so much better in all of these ways that we measured that were important for analog recording. Mm -hmm. And especially in the early days of digital, we didn't really know because the technology was so different. We didn't really know what to measure that would correlate with what we're hearing. I've noticed that. Even preamps sound different from manufacturer to manufacturer. And, and so a, as the technology changes, we're having to learn what, um, what, what to, to measure that will correlate well with what we're hearing. And, mm. uh, you know, so today you can go and buy digital microphones yes. and uh, uh, Neumann among others uh, uh, makes makes these and the the AES has even gotten a, a standard for uh, digital output of a, a directly out of a microphone mm -hmm. but the microphone itself is still the same transducer should we say in in the in the microphone it's just that you've package the preamp and the A to D converter in the microphone case instead of them being, you know, 50 feet away on, a, on the end of a microphone cable. Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, then there's some advantages to, to packing it all into, the, into that microphone. But the microphone fundamental technology is still the same. It's still that analog design. And there are certainly companies trying to come up with ways of making microphones where what comes right out of the capsule itself is digital. Right. Which will, which will change things once again. And we'll, we'll have to, uh, we'll have to learn what to measure that will be meaningful with that new technology microphone. So if there is no standard practice that microphone manufacturers follow when testing microphones, they could choose to test a microphone in a way that yields more flattering results. Yep. And, and there's a lot of different, different things uh, like that, that of, of how the testing is done. And uh, that will, will make, uh, will, will make differences in the, in the, in the test results. And hopefully, through the, the work of the AES Standards Committee, um, at least the better manufacturers are going to wind up with results that are more consistent from manufacturer to manufacturer. Let me ask you this then. Why do most manufacturers boost higher frequencies between 4 and 6K? I think that that was, again, sort of a, a, a fad thing, and it started off for a good technical reason. Um, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen one of the old Sure all-in-one all PA packages 
that they called the uh, Sheer Vocal Master. And it, it was a column, column loudspeakers with this little mixer power amp and then typically sold with SM58 microphones. And the that presence boost in the upper response of the SM58 matched up amazingly well with the high frequency roll off in the in the column loudspeakers they were selling. Gotcha. And so the combination worked. And so of course, today we have much better loudspeakers that have much smoother and more extended high frequency response. But there's still this, this well, this is what a microphone should sound like. Me personally, I'm not a fan of high boosts like that. It drives me crazy yeah. personally. And, and, and if you, uh, uh, you know, sure later came out with uh, the Beta 58. Yes. And uh, that reduced the amount of uh, uh, that that high high frequency boost, and uh, also uh, distinctly improved the uh, off axis rejection and yes, made it much because smoother it's a super than it was. Weight. Yeah, and then it, then it did with the uh, uh, with the uh, uh, the original SM58, and uh, but. You know, personally, if I had to choose between those two microphones, I'd take the beta any day. Yeah. But there's a lot of people still who, oh, they got to have their SM58. Right. I actually personally it's, like super cardioids they, better than they, cardioids. It's, it's what they've become accustomed to. Is there anywhere in the microphone specs that tells you how much deviation you could expect between a purchased microphone and the actual advertised specs? Deviation in plus or minus dB. I think you will find that that is one of the closely guarded secrets of most manufacturers. Yeah, I would think uh, so. I, I, uh, I've i done uh, the sound systems for the hearing rooms uh, for the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. And between the two, they have something like 108 hearing rooms. And I've done the sound systems for most of them. And those re require anything from... 30 to 90 microphones per system. So that's an awful lot of, of microphones. Yes, it is. And we would, we would really like them to be consistent from sample to sample. And yet we found that, uh, and in fact, at one point we were, uh, as we would commission the system, we would go around and we would put a, a calibrator over the end of each microphone and tweak the preamp gain so that the net level into the system was absolutely consistent from all the microphones. Problem was we didn't realize that they would then at the end of the day, they would take all the microphones down, pack them away in the closet. Oh, no. And then the next day, they put up random in order. The user room, they, 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 they put them back out in random order. Oh. And, and so tweaking the preamp gains to match the, the microphone sensitivities actually made things worse <laughs> than making the preamp so much for sound exactly pros being involved. <laughs> and uh, but with those, you know, pretty good quality gooseneck microphones we were using, there was probably sample of sample three dB changes in in sensitivity. So in frequency response plus or minus deviation, would it be fair to say that a mic that we use could deviate plus or minus 3 dB from the advertised specs? You know, two, you know anything from one and a half to 3 dB uh, plus or minus deviations in, in the response or, you know, I, I'd say pretty, pretty typical. Well, Ray, can you tell us where to find your book? Oh, um, yeah, the, you can find it on uh, on uh, Amazon, and uh, uh, let's see, it's. Uh, I'll put a link down in the description. Uh, th yeah, uh, it's called the microphone book. Or actually, uh, it, they they put because it it was originally written by the first two editions were written by John Ergel, and then I did the third edition, and so it's called Ergel's the microphone book, uh, and then by Ray Rayburn. And uh, so if you go to any of my websites, I'll have, 
I'll link, uh, I'll link to that uh, on it. And you also have a bunch of technical information on your website, soundfirst.com. Yes. And uh, uh, particularly if, if for people who are interested in, uh, uh, you know, uh, old microphones and stuff. Well, Ray, thank you so much for joining us today. And to your viewers at home, thanks for sticking with us. Don't forget to check out the links down in the description because Ray has provided us with a lot of information. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a phone call to make. Hey, Alan, what's up, man? Hey, dude, you got a second? Yeah, for sure. What's up? Cool. I got your answer. Um, to what question? I was hoping you'd ask. You know those two Morantz microphones that you recently reviewed on your channel? Yeah, I think I do. Yeah. Um, well... I was talking to a guy named Ray. And Have a question you'd like answered or want to add something? Be sure to write it in the comment section down below. You can also make a suggestion for future topics of discussion. Again, comment section down below or you can email me at soundspeeds at yahoo.com. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss out on future sound advice.